In this video, we will explain Mengo's theorem using some examples and then prove it. Let us consider a simple graph first. It has the following properties. It has a finite number of vertices. It is undirected and each edge is described by two vertices. One of the fundamental concepts in graph theory is the concept of a path. A path is a sequence of vertices in which consecutive vertices are connected by an edge. We define that paths must not contain repeated vertices. This means that this shown example is not a path because a vertex is visited twice. Now, let us consider two sets of vertices in such a graph. Menger's theorem states that there are at least as many separate paths between the two sets of vertices as there are vertices that must be removed to separate the two sets. Let us start from the beginning and explain the necessary concepts. How exactly is a separate or disjoint path defined? To establish a practical connection to graphs and to motivate Menger's theorem, we want to introduce a real-life example. A simplified computer network represented as a graph. The vertices are computers and the edges between vertices are the cables between the computers. Computers can send data to each other via these cables. However, computers do not need to be directly connected to exchange data. Computers can also forward data. Here, in the illustration, the left computer A can exchange data with the right computer B, even though they are not directly connected, because the middle computer C forwards the data. Thus, computers do not need to be directly connected to exchange data. In our model, two computers A and B can send messages to each other if there is a path between their corresponding vertices. Through our model network, phone calls between the computers of two people can take place, for example. Suppose Antje and Bob want to have a phone call. For them to be able to talk to each other, their computers must be connected by a path. However, the network is not perfectly stable. From time to time, individual computers fail. How can we handle this? A rerouting should be avoided in this case, as it can lead to longer waiting times. A better option would be an already existing alternative and independent connection that can be switched to. This would save waiting time. In this case, the call can continue without interruption. If Antje's or Bob's computer fails, an alternative connection would not help them. They know how to solve the problem. Each of them invites three friends to their home. These friends also start phone calls in pairs. One person at Bob's side always talks to one person at Antje's side. This way, the group of friends can communicate with each other even if one of their computers fail. Thus, the connection becomes less error-prone. The computers of Antje, Bob and their friends are not the only important ones. We must not forget that other computers in the network can also fail and may be connected in an inconvenient way. For example, it could be that all data sent between Antje's and Bob's groups of friends has to pass through a single computer. If this computer fails, there can no longer be a connection between the two groups. We want to assess how stable the connection between Antje's and Bob's groups of friends is. There are two approaches for this. Approach 1. We count the number of servers that must fail to ensure that there is no longer a connection between the groups of friends. In the displayed network, this number is 1. In the more complex version, at least three computers would have to fail to separate the groups of friends from each other. In the second approach, we count the separate connections between Antje's and Bob's groups of friends. By separate connections, 
we mean that the connections do not share any computers. This means if any computer fails and interrupts one of the separate connections, the other connections remain intact and can be used immediately. Now, let us formulate both approaches to evaluate the stability of the connection by considering the network as a graph. The computers are the vertices and the groups of friends are the vertex sets A and B. Paths between A and B are called AB paths. Approach 1. We look for the minimum number of vertices that must be removed so that there are no more AB paths. Approach 2. If two paths do not share any vertices, they correspond to separate connections. In graph theory, such separate paths are called disjoint paths. The stability is therefore measured by the maximum number of disjoint AB paths. Menger's theorem states that these two approaches always lead to the same number for any graph. In short, the minimum number of vertices required to separate A from B in the graph is equal to the maximum number of disjoint AB paths in the graph. We will show this by proving that each of these two numbers is at least as large as the other. The proof, therefore, has two directions. First, if there are L disjoint AB paths, then we need L vertices to separate A from B. Conversely, if at least K vertices are required to separate A from B, then there must be at least K disjoint AB paths. Assume there are L disjoint AB paths. Then, at least L vertices are needed to separate A from B. This is the straightforward direction of the proof. It is clear that fewer than L vertices cannot separate A from B. If L-1 vertices are removed from the graph, these come from at most L-1 disjoint paths. This means that at least one path remains unaffected by the removal. Thus, at least one path still exists. If we assume that at least k vertices are needed to separate A from B, then we can also find k disjoint AB paths. For this proof, we use mathematical induction on the number of edges in the graph. Therefore, we first show that the statement holds for a graph with no edges. This is the base case of the induction. Mathematical induction works like a series of falling dominoes. We prove that if the statement holds for all graphs with m edges and fewer, then it also holds for graphs with m plus 1 edges. This is the inductive step. By the principle of mathematical induction, this implies that the statement holds for all finite graphs. Let's start with the base case. First, we consider a graph with no edges, where A and B do not share any vertices. In this case, A and B are already separated. We need to remove zero vertices to separate A from B, and there are zero disjoint AB paths. Thus. Menger's theorem holds for this case. However, in a graph without edges, there may also be vertices that belong to both A and B. The vertices shared by A and B are precisely the vertices that need to be removed to separate A from B. But where are the disjoint AB paths in a graph without edges? For this, we need to know that a path can consist of just a single vertex. Every vertex that belongs to both A and B is itself an AB path. If A and B share K vertices, then each of these K vertices forms a disjoint AB path. This is exactly what we want to show in this direction of the proof. With this, we have established the base case of the induction. Let's recall. 
the induction proceeds on a number of edges. For the inductive step, we consider a graph with a certain number of edges and another graph with fewer edges. The graph with fewer edges is obtained from the one with more edges. We aim to show that if Menger's theorem holds for the graph with fewer edges, then it also holds for the graph with more edges. To apply this reasoning, we still need a meaningful way to reduce the number of edges in a graph. For this, we use edge contraction. This means that the two adjacent vertices merge into one. Consider two vertices u and v in the example graph g. The two vertices are connected by an edge u, v. If we now contract the edge u, v, the vertices u and v merge into a new vertex x. All vertices that were previously connected to u or v are now connected to the new vertex. All other edges in the graph remain unchanged. We call the newly formed graph g slash u, v. In Menger's theorem, we consider a graph with two vertex sets A and B. When contracting edges, we must carefully track what happens to our sets A and B. If U or V or both belong to A, then we define the new vertex X as part of A as well. Similarly, the new vertex X belongs to B if U or V or both were originally in B. We now prove the induction step for an arbitrary finite graph G with at least one edge. In G, we again have the two vertex sets A and B. We denote by K the minimum number of vertices needed to separate A from B in G. We aim to prove that we can also find K disjoint AB paths in G. To do this, we refer to graphs with fewer edges. As the induction hypothesis, we assume that a statement holds for all graphs with fewer edges. Let u v be an arbitrary edge of G. If we contract this edge, we obtain the graph G slash u v, which has at least one edge fewer than G. By the induction hypothesis, we know that in G slash U V, there exist as many disjoint A B paths as the number of vertices needed to separate A from B. Using this, we now determine the number of disjoint A B paths in G. So, how many disjoint A B paths exist in the contracted graph compared to the original graph? Case 1 there are already k disjoint AB paths in G slash UV. This means that G also contains k disjoint AB paths. Case 2. In G slash UV, there are fewer than k disjoint AB paths. By the induction hypothesis, fewer than k vertices are needed to separate A from B in G slash UV. If we denote the separating vertex set by x, then we can say x contains fewer than k vertices. One of these separating vertices is x, created by contracting the edge u v. Now we construct a new vertex set y. It contains all vertices of x, except that instead of the merged vertex x, it includes the original vertices u and v. y contains one more vertex than x. The merged vertex was replaced by the two original ones. Since x has at most k-1 vertices, we obtain y has at most k vertices. Thus, y separates a from b in g. We defined k as the minimum number of vertices needed to separate a from b in g. Therefore, since y separates a from b, it must contain at least k vertices. Combining these two facts, we conclude y contains exactly k vertices. Now we use 
y to determine the number of disjoint AB paths in G. We delete the edge UV and denote the resulting graph as G prime. Instead of the sets A and B, we now consider the sets A and Y. Any set S that separates A from Y in G prime also separates A from B in G and therefore contains at least k elements. Since G prime has one fewer edge, we can apply the induction hypothesis to G prime. Thus, we can find k disjoint a y paths in G prime. Likewise, there are k disjoint y b paths in G prime. We now reinsert the removed edge u v. At this point, we know there are k disjoint a y paths and k disjoint y b paths in G. We can combine these to construct k disjoint a b paths. If necessary, we may use the edge u v for this purpose. This completes the proof of the induction step. By the principle of mathematical induction, we conclude that in all finite graphs, if at least k vertices are required to separate a from b, then there exist k disjoint a b paths. Now we have proven both directions of Menger's theorem. Thus, for all finite graphs, the minimum number of vertices required to separate the vertex sets a and b in the graph equals the maximum number of disjoint AB paths in a graph. Our proof only applies to finite graphs because we used induction on a finite number of edges. To conclude this video, let's summarize the key results of our proof of Menger's theorem. Menger's theorem established a fundamental connection between the minimum number of vertices needed to separate two vertex sets in a graph and the maximum number of disjoint paths existing between these vertices. We have seen that these two values are always equal. This theorem is not just a theoretical result. It is a powerful tool for analyzing networks and their stability. Its applications range from computer networks and traffic planning to telecommunications, demonstrating its practical significance.